Welcome everyone to Upstream on Unsafe Space. I'm your host, Carter Laren. I usually do this live on Tuesdays at 4 p.m., but uh, today didn't do it live. I'm recording this offline and, and posting it, so I apologize for those of you who are hoping to catch me live. Anyhow, you can support Unsafe Space by going to patreon.com slash unsafe space, but who knows for how long that will be there. And you can go to unsafeshow.com. You can also follow us on Twitter at Unsafe Show. And as a reminder, this Thursday, every Thursday at 11 a.m., we have the program uh, called Deprogrammed with Carrie Smith. And we have it again this Thursday. And we'll have a guest this Thursday uh, by the name of Dr. J.R. Miller, who will be talking about racism. So thanks for, for joining. I wanted to talk, you know, there's been... There's been two recent bannings by Patreon <clears throat> that I think are significant events, and they represent a measurable ratcheting up of ideological-based deplatforming by tech companies. And one of the reasons that, you know, I, I want to talk, talk about one of the reasons that I think this is happening in Silicon Valley. I talk to a lot of founders. In fact, um, let me see if I can not give away any information someone i know the other day just had lunch with the patreon founders and got to talk about this issue with them uh, i advise a lot of founders and invest in founders and i'm seeing a lot of people uh, leave california leave um you know move their their companies uh and just and and their lives out of california there's a massive exodus here of of talent there's a lot of actually closeted non-leftists who are dreadfully afraid of coming out. I last night spoke to a tech founder who admitted that he had voted for Trump, but he did so only after a very long kind of disclaimer. He did it very quietly. He asked me not to tell anyone else. And, you know, he indicated how afraid he was of anyone finding out because it would probably ruin his company. And of course, there's big names like Peter Thiel and Tim Ferriss and those people who have left Silicon Valley. So there's clearly something going on in Silicon Valley. And this recent, these recent uh, bannings by Patreon really got me to think about this in, an, in another light. And I want to give you my thoughts on one reason I think maybe this is happening and, and will continue to happen. So a little bit of background. These two events, it was, uh, let's see. Recently, Patreon banded Milo Yiannopoulos, who I think has been banned from many places before, and a lot of people know Milo as a contrarian, conservative. He was banned for supposed association with the Proud Boys. Now, the Proud Boys is the group that was, I guess, started by Gavin McGuinness. It is not a centrally organized group so it's weird that you could get banned for associating with it because my understanding is that it's just different groups around the world kind of call themselves proud boys and and i don't think there's a lot of central organization they're they're viewed as this alt-right hate group partly because there was a rumor that the fbi had designated them as a terrorist group but that's not true they weren't and you know, I'm sure they have ideology people don't like, but they're not a hate group, and they're certainly not a terrorist organization. So banning someone for association with them is is a pretty horrible thing to do. But I actually think the the case of Sargon of Akkad is more significant. So Sargon of Akkad, whose real name is Carl Benjamin, he was earning, I think, about $12,000 a week through Patreon. He, his brand is really around political incorrectness, but the alt, he's not alt-right. They alt-right actually hate him, and he was, to my understanding, I don't follow him normally, but he was in like a verbal war with the alt-right earlier this year, and it's actually part of that war that got him banned from, from Patreon. But he was, so he was banned, actually, for off-platform speech, so not for anything he did on Patreon. Uh, he was, as I mentioned, he, there was this kind of war between Sargon, or, you know, I guess we can call him Carl. There was this war between Carl and uh, white supremacists, people he were calling Nazis, were attacking him. 
he was on someone else's YouTube channel. So this wasn't even his YouTube channel. And I guess they were using racial slurs because they're, they're white supremacists or, or whatever alt-right people who are using a lot of racial slurs. And he used their racial slurs back at them. And he said them, he said, you guys are white N-words. I'm not going to use the slur, but he said, you guys are white N-words. And he actually argued that he was using their own hateful language against them. And he claims he doesn't think that calling a bunch of Nazis the N-word could possibly be a racial slur. So that's his position on it. And this happened about 10 months ago on a channel, you know, again, it wasn't on Patreon. It wasn't even on Sargon's channels, right? He didn't link to it. It wasn't on his channel. You know, it was just someone else. I think actually the person, it was an alt-right channel, but I'm not sure. Um, they, you know, he, he didn't do any of this on Patreon. It wasn't affiliated with Patreon. But basically Patreon was perving him online and they banned him when they found something they didn't like that he said on someone's on someone's channel and in an email to sargon from someone at patreon named sydney presumably from their uh, i forget what they call it safety department or something stupid but they're their curation group the, the people who ban people he said uh, we take this is a quote he said, we take creator's entire brand into account during our review. Your brand is funded through Patreon, and your YouTube channel and the types of discussions you host on it contribute to this brand. This is also what makes your appearances on other sites relevant to the project you fund on Patreon. So, you know, as Sargon points out in response to this, nothing in Patreon's terms of service indicates that the company is going to go search the internet and evaluate your brand, right? And and in fact, recently, back in uh, I guess it's almost a year and a half now ago, but when when Patreon banned Lauren Southern, there was an a a lot of backlash for that, and Patreon founder and CEO Jack Conte explained in a very impassioned video uh he, he defended their banning of of lauren southern and he explained in a very impassioned video what patreon's policy was and how you could avoid it and he introduced this concept that i guess patreon developed called manifest observable behavior so let's take a moment and watch what jack conte said to creators about being banned and what, about what manifest observable behavior is. Content policy and the decision to remove a creator page has absolutely nothing to do with politics and ideology and has everything to do with a concept called manifest observable behavior. The purpose of using manifest observable behavior is to remove personal values and beliefs when the team is reviewing content. It's a review method that's entirely based on observable facts. What has a camera seen? What has an audio device recorded? It doesn't matter what your intentions are, your motivations, who you are, your identity, your ideology. The trust and safety team only looks at manifest observable behavior. So there you have it. That's his description of, you know, what Patreon will use to what criteria they'll use to ban, to make a decision to ban or not ban you. So that's straight from the CEO's mouth. Now, in the end of that same video, he listed a bunch of commitments that Patreon was making at that time to their creators. And those included implementing an appeals process, implementing a warning system so that you wouldn't be banned without having some warning, uh, creating a creator council with respected, quote, respected free speech advocates. He, he committed to a better notification process to creators and better communication with creators. And again, later at the end of that video, he talks about how much of an advocate for free speech he is and how much you don't really have to worry about it if you're not doing anything really kind of violent or 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 illegal or egregious let's let's watch again and see what he says at the end of this video 
I am personally a staunch advocate of free speech, and our teams are meticulous in these investigations to make sure that we're being as unbiased and as fair as possible. This never happens on a whim, and it never happens without clear-cut, manifest, observable behavior. And also, most creators, like, don't even have to think about or worry about this. Like, unless you're gonna go block the doors to a hospital or commit fraud or money laundering, like, this is just not something that you have to be worried about. So, pretty clear. Right? You shouldn't have to worry if you're being interviewed on some channel that's not yours somewhere else saying something that might piss off the Patreon censors. Sargon wasn't blocking hospital doors or money laundering or doing anything like that. And then later, uh, Jack Conte did an interview with Dave Rubin in the wake of this banning of Lauren Southern. He did an interview with Dave Rubin where Dave questioned him about patreon's hate speech policy let's see what jack conte said then how, how do you guys define what hate speech is so it's defined in great detail in the policy um, in terms of like certain things that are allowed certain things that are not allowed um, but the, the point is there's this section of the content policy that uh, that specifically mandates like the things that you can do and can't do on Patreon, the platform itself, mm -hmm. not like on Twitter, but on Patreon, the platform itself. Okay. So that's pretty clear. They're talking about stuff you do on Patreon, not other places, only on Patreon. He goes on to say that if you do kind of horrible illegal things elsewhere, he, he mentions like money laundering and, you know, preventing or, or causing death of people and that kind of stuff elsewhere, then, then you could still get banned. But in terms of, you know, speech and that kind of stuff, it's what you do on Patreon, right? So after all these commitments and after this kind of impassioned, if you notice, one of the things that I noticed about Jack's uh, video was he's very impassioned. He's very, he seems very frustrated that people think he doesn't care about free speech. Ah, ah, ah. He's very impassioned and waving his arms and doing the kind of uh, impassioned, very typical San Francisco kind of whiny, impassioned appeal. But after all of that, Patreon then banned Sargon of Akkad permanently with no warning. So far, no ability to appeal. Horrible communication he found out from his followers, not from Patreon, and didn't really violate any... Part of their terms of service, they just made something up in response, saying, "Well, actually, we made it. we look for your brand online, and you know, look at other stuff," which they've never said, and runs contrary to everything their CEO has told their patrons. So Patreon is losing a lot of followers. In fact, Jordan Peterson and Dave Rubin have talked about working on an alternative. I hope they do. I know there are some other alternatives, but uh, we desperately need alternatives to companies like Patreon. But the real thing I want to want to do is I, I want to use this as a kicking off point to to talk about one reason why I think Silicon Valley tech companies have become more brazen when it comes to using their platforms as weapons in ideological and cultural battles. And to do that, I'm going to talk about religion which I know is unusual for me. A lot of you know that I'm an atheist. For a while, I actually referred to myself as an evangelical atheist. I am no longer an evangelical atheist, but I'm still a staunch atheist. And although I do host a show with, with Kerry Smith, who is, who is Christian, and I have uh, other Christian friends, myself, I'm an atheist, and I'm not apologetic about it, and I'm not, I'm not trying to give religion sympathy that I don't think it deserves. However, I want to talk about religion for a moment because I think the decline of religion in America is partially responsible for what we're seeing in, in an indirect way. So bear with me. You know, religion in America has declined over the past uh, several decades. I don't think that's news to anyone. And religious belief in Silicon Valley and probably California generally, but at least Silicon Valley area, is particularly low. And that's probably not a surprise to anyone either. So if we look at a couple of studies, um, first of all, if we look at kind of this look at the importance of religion in Americans' lives, in the 1950s and 60s, over 70% of 
of the people surveyed said that religion was very important to them. Now, by 2007, that number dropped to 56%, and then it was down to 53% in 2014. And that's according to a, a Pew, the Pew 2014 Religious Landscape Study. And so that's, again, down to 53% by 2014. You can probably still drop it. Now, in San Francisco, it's actually 34%. So this is 34% of the people say that religion is very important to them. So not a lot of people. In addition, kind of the, the all the even people who think it's mildly important, that number's dropped as well. So the general religiosity, for lack of a better term, has has gone down. In a Gallup poll, um, you see a drop from 1993 to 2017 from 58% to 51% in in kind of we'll call religiosity in America, right? So why do I bring this up, especially as an atheist? Why does this matter? Um, I'm, I'm not about to make an argument that there's uh, demons or that prayer would help. Don't worry, fellow atheists. I'm bringing it up because religion provides people with meaning. Like it or not, religion provides people with meaning. meaning. And, you know, Jordan Peterson talks about this. Um, in fact, let me read an excerpt from something he wrote regarding this. Jordan, he says, we are in a state of constant unredeemed suffering, and it's a big problem. There is another inference in the New Testament, and its hypothesis of a metastate, and the inference is that a life that is predicated on a constant death and renewal at every level of being, a life that's predicated on the search for the truth and an attempt to act out the truth, and a life associated with the sacrifice of self to God produces a state of being that is so deeply meaningful that it justifies suffering. Now, Jordan's a lot more into suffering in kind of this malevolent universe perspective than I am, but he's talking about, look, I think Jordan considers himself Christian kind of by default, but I don't think he's really practicing. But he's again, he's talking about the meaning of religion. And... And actually, he also quotes he also quotes Nietzsche in another writing and kind of describes what he thinks Nietzsche meant here. He says, he who has a why can bear any how. That's Nietzsche. And Jordan writes, and what he meant by that was, if you are aiming, if what you're aiming at is of sufficient profundity, it's worth an awful lot of misery to participate in the process of bringing it about. So again, Jordan talking about the the meaning of, or, or the uh, the fact that religion brings meaning to people. And as I said, I don't believe in the existence of God, and you don't actually have to believe in the existence of God or be religious to understand that people draw um, meaning from religion. So, b- by the way, as an aside, the definition, so when I say I'm an atheist, I go by kind of the George Smith, George H. Smith's definition. Atheism is the absence of a belief in God and nothing more. And he writes, if the atheist, if, if the theist wishes to draw monumental implications from this lack of belief, he must argue for his claims. And I'm totally in George Smith's camp there. Uh, I do believe that we are all born atheist because we're born not believing in a, uh, in a in a god, and we have to learn religion. And again, Richard Dawkins, another famous atheist, he says we're all atheists about most of the gods that humanity has ever believed in. Some of us just go one God further. So that's the camp that I'm in. But even the atheists, right, even Richard Dawkins understands the link between religion and the meaning that it provides for many people, right? He criticized it, but he understood it. And let's read in, uh, Richard Dawkins' quote where he criticizes this, but, but does recognize that there's meaning here for people. Quote, There is something infantile in the presumption that somebody else has a responsibility to give your life meaning and point. The truly adult view, by contrast, is that our life is as meaningful, as full, and as wonderful as we choose to make it. So that's Richard Dawkins. So if you grow up in a religious culture, which most people in America do, when you you discover or rediscover (laughs) atheism, if you do, or even if you just slightly kind of abandon religion and start drifting away and not treating it as seriously, you automatically inherit in, inherit this 
this absence of meaning in your life because religion does provide meaning. And most people, they, people don't do well without meaning in their lives, right? And atheists, or, or again, even people who aren't fully atheists but just don't take their religion all that seriously, they look to fill that hole where meaning used to be when they no longer have religion. And, and that meaning was provide, provided by religion for them. Now, as an atheist, I would argue that having an integrated philosophy that provides both moral guidance and meaning is not only preferable, but it's necessary if, if you want to avoid being a pawn in someone else's game. If you don't provide your own moral compass and meaning consciously and deliberately, then the people and the culture around you will provide it to your subconscious. And that will make you easy to manipulate. I actually want to, I know I'm talking about religion and, and atheism a lot here, but it's important for context. I actually want to read a passage. Ayn Rand illustrates the need for philosophy beautifully in a 1974 speech that she gave to West Point graduates. And it's called Philosophy Who Needs It. I'm not going to read the whole speech here, but I am going to read a portion of it. Again, she's speaking to the West Point graduates. She says, You might claim, as most people do, that you have never been influenced by philosophy. I will ask you to check that claim. Have you ever thought or said the following? Don't be sure. Don't be so sure. Nobody can be certain of anything. You got that notion from David Hume and many, many others, even though you might never have heard of him. Or, this may be good in theory, but it doesn't work in practice. You got that from Plato. Or, that was a rotten thing to do, but it's only human. Nobody is perfect in this world. You got, you got that from Augustine. Or, it may be true for you, but it's not true for me. You got it from William James. Or, I couldn't help it. Nobody can help anything he does. You got it from Hegel. Or, I can't prove it, but I feel that it's true. You got it from Kant. Or, it's logical, but logic has nothing to do with reality. You got it from Kant. Or, it's evil, because it's selfish. You got it from Kant. Have you heard the modern activists say, act first, think afterwards? They got that from John Dewey. Now, some people might answer, sure, I've said those things are at different times, but I don't have to believe that stuff all the time. It may have been true yesterday, but it's not true today. They got it from Hegel. They might say, consistency is the hobgoblin of little minds. They got it from a very little mind, Emerson. They might say, but can't one compromise and borrow different ideas from different philosophies according to the expediency of the moment? They got it from Richard Nixon, who got it from William James. I'll stop there, but I think it's a, I, I love that description of the the fact that you do adopt the philosophy unconsciously if you don't do it consciously and when people are religious it's a it's a conscious adoption maybe it didn't start out that way when they were young it was they were indoctrinated by their parents but it, it becomes a, a conscious choice to believe and to to derive your moral code and set of uh, behavioral standards from that religion and when you lose that religion, when you abandon it, you it's not like you go back to a tabula rasa. You don't start with a blank slate. You absorb all the philosophy around you. And I think she makes a, a beautiful illustration there to that effect. So meaning for people is essential, right? But most non-religious people don't put in the conscious effort to replace their previously, you know, their previously held religious views with any sort of rigorously chosen system of values or meaning or philosophically consistent um, moral code. And in the absence of a chosen or consciously derived philosophy, many non-religious people simply replace God with the state. Right? It it translates into this belief in larger and larger governments, right? It's very, you know, God's an authoritarian. They just kind of transfer the, the daddy concept to the state. And now daddy runs everything, and, but that daddy's now the state instead of God, 
right? And so this leads to this, this belief in larger and larger governments, more and more control over the lives of its citizens. And of course, there's nothing I think more notorious for this than Marxism. Uh, but you know, it's also true in the watered down versions of, of Marxism, like quote, democratic socialism, right? And Karl Marx understood this. We all have, uh, we've all heard the famous line, religion is the opiate of the masses. The official state ideology of the Soviet Union was Marxist-Leninism, and that includes this their, their version of scientific atheism, right? And so, with Marxism, you have that uh, you have that replacement of of God with with the state, right? And even more than that, I think you know Karl Marx when he critiques there's a critique of Hegel's philosophy of right, and Karl Marx actually writes about. Uh, religion and understands kind of he also kind of understands that there's there's value and purpose there even though just like Dawkins he was criticizing it let me read can't believe I'm going to quote Karl Marx uh, <laughs> I'm going to read something that Marx wrote he writes religious distress is at the same time the expression of real distress and the protest against real distress religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature the heart of a heartless world just as it, is, as it is the spirit of a spiritless situation. It is the opium of the people. The abolition of religion as the illusory happiness of the people is required for their real happiness. The demand to give up the illusion about its conditions is the demand to give up a condition which needs illusions. Now, obviously, I don't agree with... I'm not, I'm not a Marxist. I'm the opposite of a Marxist. But um, even, even this kind of famous atheist, Marxist... Well, Karl Marx, like the original Marxist, right? even he understands that there's some psychological value to religion. And he obviously proposes um, that it needs to be given up, right? And he doesn't say this explicitly here, but kind of replaced with service to the state, which is, is it abhorrent. Horrible idea. It's like, you know, he gives up something that's, you know, it's, in my view, it's like, uh, I don't know, you got a broken leg and you give it up by getting cancer. That's not helpful. So anyway, you can uh, you can kind of see this leaning right towards towards bigger government among atheists, right? Not not just anecdotally, but this shows up in surveys. And so the reason I'm talking about this is there's this kind of connection here and it it not all atheists, right? I'm a capitalist, but among atheists in general, there tends to be this leaning towards kind of bigger government and pseudo-Marxist ideology. So if you just look in kind of standard surveys, the Pew 2014 religious landscape study that I, I mentioned earlier, atheists are only 16% Republican, but they're 65% Democrat, all right? So several times more likely to be Democrat. Um, in 2017, uh, Baylor did a religion survey and noted that almost no atheists voted for Trump, right? So in the absence of meaning beyond themselves, right, another place people look besides, a, you know, or maybe in addition to the state. So, you know, we've got these people kind of looking toward the state. They, t they transfer this religion towards state worship in some way. And I think part of that is an attempt to find meaning. Part of it is to an attempt to just, just find some rules and authority, people like authority, and if there's not a god, there's got to be a government for them. Um, but another place that they look, in addition to that, I think, is they look towards kind of the, the hierarchically organized group of people that's closest to them. And that's their job. So we're going to come back to Patreon here. Instead of kind of like a more traditional view of a job where it's kind of a place where you earn a paycheck or grow your skills people are increasingly finding meaning, deep religious meaning from their careers. And, and this is apparent when you notice trends in things like social entrepreneurship, right? Which is this idea that building a company for, for building the company's sake isn't enough. It's gotta be doing some other thing, right? That is quote, good. Now I think building a company is good, but it, this, this concept of social entrepreneurship is like, well, building a company is bad. You got to kind of offset it by doing something else. Um, 
And you know, you've got terms like conscious capitalism being thrown around. Like, well, we've got to moderate this evil capitalism thing, right? And you've got the rise of B Corps here in California. B Corporations are uh, not traditional corporations. They have kind of this extra mission that's built into the, to the, uh, the bylaws of the corporation. And so you see those kind of trends. And look, things like company mission statements uh, or variations of those and company values, they've been around forever. I'm not suggesting that those are new. And this is actually an area that I know quite a bit about. I spent years teaching founders about the importance of building uh, what I would call brand foundations for their companies. And I've written art, you know, articles about this. I've given dozens of lectures about this to founders. Um, it's not just me that talks about this, right? I didn't, I didn't make this stuff up, but there's this idea in Silicon Valley of finding your why, right? Why are you starting a business? And this is a common trope and there's lots of variants on this. And all of them are kind of similar to how I structure my, my brand foundation. And so I'm gonna talk about that for a minute. At the top of the brand foundation that I ask founders to complete, there's always, um, the first thing is always purpose, right? And this is the why. And I tell them to, to, to develop a, a, a why, a purpose for your company that goes beyond like a monetary goal, like we want to be worth a billion dollars, but as a, as a purpose that, that provides you know, clarity about your goals and directions for, for the company. And that helps make decision making easier. Like, you know, our purpose is to, you know, make the world's information, you know, organize the world's information or whatever. That's Google's purpose, right? So it provides clarity and helps you make decisions as you grow as a company, but it also inspires employees because money alone doesn't. So if you have a purpose that's like, I want to be a billion dollar company, all that sounds like to any employee that you would hire is like, I want a private jet, help me get one, right? It does, like employees don't care that you want your company to be worth a billion dollars. But if you have a bigger purpose, they can kind of rally around that and, and find meaning. And I think, I don't remember exactly the SpaceX purpose, but it's... Um, I think it's something about life on Mars, right? It's not like a huge inspirational idea. And people rally rally behind that. And I think, uh, and and also, by the way, it's not just purposes, right? It's, it's also values. It's company values and company culture. And these things have been, you know, becoming increasingly important in Silicon Valley, right? It's increasingly important for people to be able to rally around the company values and the company mission, right? So in the past... Just as an example, in the past when companies were looking to hire people, they might advertise things like, uh, here are the interesting problems that you can work on. We have competitive salaries and here are the benefits and this is, this is why you should come work for us. Now, if you look, most tech companies are advertising their values and their cultures very prominently. This is what our culture is like, be part of our mission and these are our values. And that's what they think, and, and maybe accurately, that's what they think will appeal to potential employees. And so that's kind of been a shift in how companies advertise themselves. And it's increasingly common, I think, for people to view their company, their career, as a means by which they do good work in the world, right? It's not through their uh, Rotary Club or church or whatever in the past. They've, they've attached the, the doing good work and this kind of moral significance to their company. There's this phrase like make the world a better place. It's it's so common that it's become a parody, right? So HBO's show Silicon Valley, I'm sure a lot of people have watched it. It, it parodies life in Silicon Valley and life at startups in Silicon Valley, right? And Eric Walters, a guy by the name of Eric Walters, writes in, in 2014, he wrote an article that said, five things that Silicon Valley gets right about the tech industry. And he means the show, Silicon Valley. And let me just, uh, so number four of his things, I'll just read you number four. Number four is the let's make the world a better place cliche. This is something that the show gets right about Silicon Valley. And he writes, everywhere you turn, there are startups sprouting from basements, studio apartments, and yes, garages. But these days, a tech startup isn't content on simply making a better CMS, a more durable phone, or even meat grown in a lab. They need to, quote, make the world a better place. Of course, with their tremendous attempts at making a better CMS, a more durable phone, or lab-grown meat. Hooli, though not a startup, is no different. Hooli is the fict fictional a fictitious company in the show. He goes on to write, 
they aren't out to simply innovate the world's technology. They're out to change it for the better, or so they say. It's a line that's been smartly repeated throughout the series so far, and if you've ever worked in a startup, you know exactly how common these tremendously overwrought statements are. Guys, spot on. Eric was spot on when he wrote that. Um, that is how it's like in Silicon Valley. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to want your job to be meaningful. That's good. Meaningful jobs are, I think, both psychologically and materially preferable to pointless jobs. But I think this longing, this yearning desire that people seem to have to find deep meaning in their careers is partially a result of a decreased tendency to find meaning elsewhere in their lives. And that's partially decreased because of the decrease in religion. So one of the results here is that people have abandoned religion and and now they're increasingly viewing their jobs as tools for shaping the world in the image that they think is ideal or optimal, right? The company values are the new Ten Commandments. That's what's happened. And one way this manifests is in how these tech companies, like Patreon, deplatform people, right? They come up, just as an example, right? They'll come up with language around hate speech that is ideological in nature, and then they assure us that they're going to implement this objectively, right? Well, first of all, the concept of hate speech itself is ideological, and it's clearly based on identity politics and intersectionality, right? So there's no politically or even philosophically neutral definition of hate speech, right? It would be like, it would be like someone saying, well, I, I'm not religious, but we really need to define sin. It's like, well, that's a religious concept. Or we really need to define the soul. That's a religious concept. So let me just, since, since Patreon is, is uh, the main star in this podcast today, let's look at Patreon's hate speech uh, example here. They write, hate speech includes serious attacks or even negative generalizations of people based on their race, ethnicity, national origin, religion, sex, gender, sexual orientation, age, disability, or serious medical conditions. So this is identity politics. Does it really matter if you're hated on for your sexual orientation or your age or hated on for something else that doesn't make you the member of some group? It's, it's just placing people in groups, right? Um, and, and it's things like age, right? Which is weird, right? Negative generalizations. So if you take this literally, if you want to be strict about it, negative generalizations of people based on their age. Toddlers are idiots. Well, that's, a vi that's hate speech, right? Or toddlers are generally dumb. Okay, well, that's hate speech, right? Or they don't, maybe we won't say dumb, maybe don't have knowledge, right? Um, disability or serious medical conditions, like... I don't know, uh, people with muscular dystrophy are crappy at basketball. Oh my God, that's hate speech, right? So you can be very strict about that definition. And you can be very loose about the definition as well. Uh, maybe that was an example of being very loose, but it doesn't matter. The definition is, is by its nature political. Because not everyone views the world and views other people as members of these categories. So the idea that you need to have view people as members of these categories and your treatment of them as a member of a category is different somehow from your treatment of them outside of the structure of a member of a category, right? So being an asshole to someone is just being an asshole to someone. Calling them names is just calling them names. But through this concept of hate speech, doing those things to them, if you're doing those things connected to their categorization, then it's hate speech. So it's already political just to start with. But second of all, you know, not only is the concept political, but they don't use the same standards, obviously, when applying it to different groups. And this is something we all know, right? When they deal with people who they agree with, they employ a very strict interpretation of hate speech, right? And they're altogether reasonable about reviewing content. Well, technically, that's not. That's fine, right? But when they deal with people they dislike, 
they interpret hate speech very loosely. Um, and, and then they apply, dr you know, draconian punishments to, to violating the hate speech rules. All right. And a lot of these companies will even make it clear if you actually read what they write, a lot of these companies will make it clear that they know that the whole, that the whole concept is political and, and ideological and philosophical. So let's look at Twitter's Twitter. Twitter makes it clear um, in their their content policy here. Twitter make Twitter make Twitter. <laughs> Twitter is the porn version of Twitter. Uh, Twitter makes it clear that the company does two things. First, embraces the idea of intersectionality, which, as I said, is an ideology in and of itself. And two, uses that ideolo ideology uses that idea of intersectionality to make decisions about what constitutes hateful conduct. They admit this openly. They write. Research has shown that some groups of people are disproportionately targeted with abuse online. This includes women, people of color, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, asexual individuals, marginalized and historically underrepresented communities. For those who identify with multiple underrepresented groups, abuse, now that's intersectionality, abuse may be more common, more severe in nature, and have a higher impact on those targeted. So that's, that's intersectionality that they're describing to a T. We are committed to combating abuse motivated by hatred, prejudice, or intolerance, particularly abuse that seeks to silence the voices of those who have been historically marginalized. For this reason, we prohibit behavior that targets individuals with abuse based on protected category. So they're being clear. Look, we believe in social justice intersectionality ideology, and we will use it accordingly as part of our hate speech uh, enforcement. Interestingly, another topic for another day maybe is this this word abuse. Um, they conflate the word abuse, right? Abuse, like what does that mean? Phys like physical abuse is clear. Verbal abuse is very unclear. And so they're committing to combating abuse motivated by X, Y, and Z. I would say you should either be committed to combating abuse and make it clear what that is or not be committed to combating abuse and let ver verbal abuse happen on your platform. But if you're going to be, if you're going to combat verbal abuse, who cares what the motivation is? It's verbal abuse. But again, it's this, it's this ideology of social justice and this intersectionality mindset that uh, causes Twitter to care what your motivations for your verbal abuse are. <sighs> so, you know, prior to this trend of conflating your company culture with your personal moral crusade, you were under no moral obligation to act against people with whom you disagreed, right? So think about it this way. If you're running a video hosting platform and someone says something that you think is appalling and they're espousing ideas that you think are counterproductive to the proper evolution of society, right? You might have just ignored them, right? And thought to yourself, well... I disagree with this person's ideas. They're a jerk, but the purpose of the company here is really just to provide this platform in the most optimal and efficient way possible. So, you know, in other words, you know, it's not my company's business, really. I'm not going to be a busybody. I'm not going to finger wag. I'm not going to try and police morality by my standards. I'm just going to stay out of it, right? I've got other outlets in my life for political and ideological activism, if that's what I want to do. I don't need to use my company to make myself feel moral and, and feel like I'm doing, quote, doing good in the world, right? So if you, have, if you have meaning outside of your company, you don't feel compelled to use your company in that way. But, you know, it's a lot harder to ignore that video that you don't like if you feel like everything associated with your company is somehow a projection of your own moral worth, right? Your own ideology. If, if you're like, oh my God, if there's a hate speecher, speaker on my platform, that means that we promote hate speech. Ah! And I can't do that because we've got to make the world a better place. And it's my only outlet for being moral is my company, right? When your company and your moral code are inextricably tied together, it's really hard to adopt the philosophy of just live and let live, right? You can't, you can't do that. It's really hard because you got no other outlet for your moralizing. 
<sighs> Look, the, I think the fracturing of this, this corporate landscape into religious denominations, it's not sustainable in a homogeneous or in a non-homogeneous society, right? And it's not compatible with individualism. Right? It's not compatible with the principles of, of a free society. So in Silicon Valley today, that's where I think we are, right? We've got a large percentage of people who view their careers as a primary means, as their primary means for ideological activism, right? And that's dangerous. It's really dangerous. And like I said, it doesn't work in any kind of heterogeneous society with different ideas and, and uh, different thoughts. It's anti-freedom. Now, fortunately, I think we're at a tipping point, partly because of the Sargon of Akkad thing. So I guess we can thank Patreon for that. I think we're at a tipping point economically here, right? And these Silicon Valley-based tech companies that have wed themselves to the social justice ideology, I think they're going to start to see some real and painful competition in the market. And good. You know, that's the beauty of capitalism. So I'm looking forward to it. That's it for today's upstream. Thanks for watching. Please feel free to follow us on Twitter at Unsafe Show. You can, oh, we're, our YouTube channel has a name. It's Unsafe Space. So I think you can just do YouTube slash C slash Unsafe Space. I think is how you get to it. So please follow us, like, subscribe on, on YouTube. Uh, as of now, you can go to patreon.com slash Unsafe Space, but maybe we'll switch to one of these competitors soon. You can always go to unsafeshow.com to support us. Please share, like, tell your friends. You know, the best way, thing you can do to support us is to just talk about the show. Um, and as always, audio versions of this will be available in podcast form. Thanks again for watching slash listening. Have a good day.